Hey, deserving listeners, it's time for the eighth installment in which I, as a couples therapist, reacts to Darcy and Jesse on 90 Day Fiance. Let's watch some clips and see if I say anything that makes any sense at all. Let's see what happens. This morning, I was upstairs getting ready, and my toes were cold from the wood floors. So I put my feet on his shoes. He got pissed off that my feet were on his shoe, and then he's like, what are you doing? And like shoved me out the door. She was stepping on my shoe trying to put them on, stepping on it. Absolutely madness. I wasn't trying to ruin your shoe, it was just my foot was cold. He's like, how would you like it if I did it to you? I was like, here, take my shoe, take my thousand dollar shoe, go ahead and step on it, here you go. Wow, just, uh, that's all I have to say is wow. Uh, also, what I have to say is I have a list here of things that I'm supposed to say. Subscribe and hit the bell. Then also become a patron of the podcast by going to patreon.com. And also subscribe to our podcast on a podcast app on your phone. And let's get back to this massive train wreck. I mean, this is not just a train wreck. It's like five trains crashing into each other at the same time. It's an assault. It throw it at him. Okay, threw it towards the bag, not at him. Listen, I'm going away from you. Who are I'm they? going to call the police. Police? So go, go away. I didn't do anything. Uh, yes, you do. What did I do, you Jesse? Are very, you're scaring me very much. Wow, well, you're much. overreacting. Unbelievable. Call the police. Calling the police. Okay. This is really escalating. She threw shoes at my head. Now it's a Louis Vuitton. Shoe, what's next? A glass? I don't know. Now, if I divorce myself from my feelings about him, it is a accurate statement to say that if someone throws something at you, it is a valid conclusion to say, well, what's next? Is it gonna be a glass? Could it be something that would really hurt me? That is a valid thing to say, and, and we all need to think about that when we're escalating and we're getting upset, that we need to not do the kinds of things like throwing things at people. There's nothing wrong with being frustrated. There's nothing wrong with needing to take a break, but people, please avoid that. Even if most people would say you were in the right, the law does not look at the full picture, it, it will look at, well, it does look at the full picture sometimes, but sometimes it will not look at the full picture or misinterpret the full picture, and it will look at just that behavior, and you can actually be charged with that. So if he were to call the police right now and he made a good case, she actually could be in trouble. So please avoid that. If you feel unsafe or you feel frustrated, there's a lot of other options for you to get safe and for you to vent your feelings that you deserve. Uh, putting yourself in the in the danger of the law or even putting yourself in danger of harming someone, which of course is not probably what you're trying to do, uh, then let's try to avoid that. Oh, I feel not safe anymore. Oh my God, now he doesn't feel safe. I didn't do anything. Spin it, go ahead, spin it. I'm tired of having to defend myself over things that are misconstrued and over-dramatized. Wow, what an ass. Jesse, are you Oh, hell yeah. Before I call the cops. <laughs> so there's two possibilities here that I could see given the full picture of all the behaviors we've seen thus far. One is that he actually legitimately believes that he has been abused in this moment and his reactivity looks strange to us, but from the inside of his emotion, it actually feels consistent and rational to him. There could be some abuse that he went through. I obviously don't know that. There's a lot of speculation there. But that's an hypothesis that I, if he were a client, I would investigate. The second possibility is that he absolutely knows that he wasn't being abused and that he absolutely knows that he's safe. But he's using this as some way of trying to uphold his, that superior defense mechanism, trying to make him out to be the victim so that he can try to project a story that he's hoping people will see of he's a good guy and she's the evil person. That, that's one of the things that is often very confusing to people who don't treat people with narcissism, which is that it's not that they try to portray themselves in a certain way, it's that they have to believe they are that way and they will distort all reality to kind of fit it. 
not be not necessarily because they're trying to trick people, but mainly because they're trying to trick themselves. Because I don't know him, but people who present behavior like him and and suffer from narcissism, like I said, there's that deep, just giant ball of negative self worth and emptiness, and a thin veil of superiority and dominance and specialness and grandiosity that is barely covering it up. When there's a breakup like this, they will check in with themselves, as we all do, to try to figure out what's going on. What's happening right now is probably part of what his brain is paying attention to. Why is this? Why is this conflict happening? Well, they check in with themselves and they say, "Okay, how do I evaluate this?" But all they see is this massive defense that they've been building up that they're ever more needful of in this moment because of the threats happening right here. Of like, I'm perfect. Nothing is wrong with me. Everything is wrong with her. I don't need anybody else. What she did to me was terribly wrong. So the subconscious is saying something to the effect of, "If I believe and I and I distort reality that it's all her fault and that I'm not the abusive one, she's the abusive one. I don't have problems. She's the one who has problems. I'm not the one who ended this relationship. She's the one that caused this relationship to end." So this is the subconscious saying, "If I." force myself to believe those things, then I can walk away feeling like I'm a special, superior human being. And everyone else will see it too, because it's obvious. Now, that's what the conscious mind is saying. The subconscious is partially aware of the fact that none of this is true. So the subconscious is partially trying to trick his own conscious mind because he needs that to be true in order to function with with his with his life. What I'll say is is that people with profiles like him tend to have a lot of loneliness in life. They tend to have a lot of relationships that don't work out for them. And even when they do work out, given his his reactivity, there tends to be a lot of distance and a lot of uns, unspoken words between the two. Because you just try to imagine what sort of woman would fit well with him. Well, it might be someone who just never says anything, who just does whatever he says to do. That's That seems to be the only kind of configuration that would work with him. I don't know, of course. But people like that, they tend to have just a a, a long string of loneliness. And so I, I'd wonder about his previous relationships. I don't know. Maybe if he were sitting here, he'd be like, I've had perfect relationships in the past, but who knows? Anyway. What's this calling the cops and stuff? That's ridiculous. This is dangerous because uh, I would not be sitting here if I would had that Louis Vuitton in my eye. Uh, if I didn't dodge it, that could have been happened. I can't take it anymore. I'm just trying to like defend myself, and now he's making it worse. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. It's just, it's just hard. I mean, when I see Darcy in this situation, I, I also see a, a small, little child, not in a bad way, in a good way. She's regressing. It's, it's a very sad, vulnerable place that she's in right now, and you know, my heart breaks for her. The, the thing that I was trying to say earlier, which I don't think I really said quite right, which I will try to say again, which is that when you have that veil of superiority, that, that defensive mechanism that you're, that you're building up, it becomes so convincing to the person that they believe everyone else will see it too, even though most people upon scrutiny of the situation will, will see obviously through that veil. I'm guessing most people when they watch this show, they do not see Jesse as a perfect human being who is a victim of Darcy. I'm guessing that's not what they see. But when people suffer from narcissism, their idea of themselves is so distorted that they just believe, well, naturally everyone's gonna see how perfect I am and how I wasn't to blame for any of this and how I was a victim of domestic violence because I see it in this, it's a bright light that I see. And, and of course, everyone else is gonna see that bright light too. That's part of the condition. It's part of the confusing aspect of it. When you see people with these personalities, they tend to shoot themselves in the foot because they, they, they're, just, they're so distorted because of their need to have distorted the, uh, their reality when they were young that they can't even see that everyone else can see through it. You might be able to identify other people in your life or public figures, politicians, if you will, who also suffer from this. And they seem to just waltz through life like everything's fine and they, they seem to be totally convinced that everything's fine when everyone around them is like 
does no one else, how does that person act like everything's, no one else sees this person as fine. Again, underneath that is a vast sea of worthlessness that the person cannot tolerate looking at or to be acknowledged. And so that's why they're doing it. But anyway, so I wonder if this is the end of this relationship. Uh, whoa, 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 whoa. This, do you, do you think after this that we're going to stay together? A girlfriend who assaults me? I, I don't feel okay with being alone with her. I just want someone, whether that's security, whether that's someone from the team, to stay with me to protect like me and, and, and any, any escalation from happening. We didn't get to see her throw the shoe at him. It's highly suspicious that, that all of us having seen it would interpret it the same way that he would. So it's hard to know, but it certainly sounds like a odd way of looking at the situation. Again, we didn't get to see it, we weren't there, but it certainly sounds like an odd narrative that he has. If she thinks this is acceptable, I am most definitely out, most definitely. Now, I know a lot of people on the internet love to use the term gaslighting, and they might actually be seeing what he's doing as quote unquote gaslighting. Typically gaslighting is a word, now the, the word is evolving quickly through our culture, so I never know exactly what definition people are using, but the typical definition is when someone uh, premeditated, premeditates a campaign that they go on with someone altering their life and, and screwing with their reality to try to make someone go quote unquote crazy or to get someone to think that they're hallucinating and so that they're so off kilter that they don't have any power anymore. Uh, you're, you're essentially getting someone to question their own reality, right? So gaslighting typically is when someone goes on a campaign and it's malicious and it's calculated, it's Machiavellian, it's potentially sadistic or instrumental because you, you want something from that person. And that's the definition of gaslighting. In relationships, I find that a lot of people on the internet are using that term for people like this. And it's fine, I guess, but that's not how I would frame it because people in his position and Darcy's position, they're from the outside, we can at least say that what they're saying doesn't make a lot of sense to us. So that's kind of the baseline. What he is saying doesn't make a lot of sense to us. He's claiming he's a victim of, of abuse. It, most onlookers would not frame it that way. What, so why is he saying that? Well, a lot of people are jumping, particularly for men, by the way, it seems to be overwhelmingly applied from women to men as if women don't distort things because of course everyone has histories that cause them to distort things. But anyway, so the, the conclusion that a lot of people will come to is he is on a campaign to screw with her reality to make her go crazy and to make her question her reality. And it's possible that that's what's happening. We can't get inside his head. We can't ask him these questions and, and assess that situation. More commonly, what is happening is what I've been talking about before, where you have someone with tremendous relational traumas themselves and they are desperately trying to react to a situation to uphold their defensive structure, which for these people typically involves this veil of and this fantasy of superiority. And I didn't do anything wrong. It's all them. And the subconscious convinces the conscious of a lot of odd things. So you could say that uh, a, a more likely scenario is that his subconscious is gaslighting him, which is gaslighting her. Uh, now, some of you might get angry at me for saying that. Uh, what I'm not saying, and I want to be clear, I'm not saying that his behavior is okay. Okay, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that Darcy should put up with his behavior. <laughs> I, I think I've said this either in this episode or previous. If anyone treated me the way he is treating her, I would have left him like that. I would have left him as a citizen. If anyone, and I've been treated like that before, I instantly see it for what it is. And, I, and I'm like, oh, that's the tip of the iceberg. If you're capable of that, you're capable of much worse. So there's no point in this continuing. See ya. Uh, don't let the, the door hit you in the back on the way out. So I'm not saying that it's good behavior. I'm not saying it's acceptable. I'm not saying you're supposed to put up with it. But I am saying that this 
narrative and this conceptualization that people like this are essentially sadistic psychopaths and are purposely trying to screw with other people's minds is not usually the case. Usually the case that I see is someone who is developmentally much younger than their age and they're uh, very distorted and they're overreactive and they're quite desperate in their reactions and it ends up looking like they're trying to screw with you. Uh, so I obviously don't know what's going on in his head, but I'm telling you from experience, because uh, with people like this, they come to my office and we have months, weeks, you know, weeks, months, years to investigate why they do what they do. And what I find is, is what I'm telling you. I, I obviously don't know about him, but uh, I'm just telling you the most likely scenario. With the shoe throwing, it's like I've reached my limit. My rational mind says, yes, run away very far. But my heart says, Peter for her, don't give up. Keep giving her chances. So that's very interesting, right? It would appear from his behavior that he doesn't care about her that he doesn't have any vulnerability, that he doesn't have any neediness on the inside. But right there, it's just so apparent that when the relationship looks like it is done and it is over, and yet he gets to that point and he's like, but I want it. Now, he, a more vulnerable, someone who's more comfortable with their vulnerability, a more confident, more securely attached person would say something like, I don't know, I just love her and I, I feel really bad for what happened and I want to apologize and I need her. I really do need her. We have a connection. I need her. That's not what he's saying, but he's through his behavior, it indicates something in that direction maybe that he would. he's still coming back to her. Now, again, I always have this cynical part of my brain that's like, well, he – he wants to be a part of a reality TV show and he wants to string that along. And he might have three girlfriends back home. Who knows? I, I don't, we don't see any evidence of that, but I'm always just wondering like what's, what's really going on. But if we take it for face value, it, it is consistent with what I'm talking about. People who have, who, who are in the narcissistic spectrum are the loneliest people on the planet because they've effectively pushed everyone away. And they never let on about their vulnerability and they never allow anyone to take care of them. When I treat people with narcissistic personality, one of the ways I can get under their skin is to connect with their loneliness and to connect with the deep disconnection they feel from other human beings. And deep down, they really, really want that. And that's the leverage that I'll use is you deserve to have secure attachments. You deserve to have people take care of you. So let's try, and the road to you getting that need met is through vulnerability. Now, I have almost no confidence in this situation working out, but if it was gonna work out, it would be for Jesse to be vulnerable in this moment, to say he's sorry and really mean it, and to say that he needs her and that he depends on her in a deep way. Now, if, the past informs the present. He will be sweet to her, which will warm her up somehow. He will overfunction and he will start to lay the groundwork for that superiority by establishing that she's the one with the problem. And he will do that early and he will escalate that. And they will, it'll just be because we've seen this pattern before. But I don't know. It's interesting that he was totally ready to go. He had his bags packed. He, and then he's saying, but he wants to be with her. So maybe he had a moment of clarity. We'll see what happens. I thought this trip will help us mend whatever problems we've been having, but I, I don't know if he's really here to fix the problem. I think he just wants to cause more problems. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The issue is not me. The problem was caused by you. So there we go, <laughs> like a broken record. We're right back in the same mode where he's saying the problem's not me, it's you. It's you, you are the problem. So, I mean, I, I don't know why I expected anything else. If you wanna change this, you gotta seek help. And if you work on yourself, 
then we can grow into something really beautiful. So I will tell you that one of the roads for people like him getting help is actually through couples therapy. That a lot of times there's this deep need for people like him with his profile, I can't diagnose him, but people that I've treated like him, who will come across as they're like, I have, I have my stuff together, it's, it's my wife that's the crazy one. And deep down, they desperately need that connection and they're desperately afraid of being alone, but they won't let on that they're afraid of being alone. And they'll come into couples therapy to work on their relationship. And then the narrative will be that, you know, she's the one and he'll sit there and be like, well, I'm just here to kind of work on a relationship, but really it's, you know, it's her that needs the help. And then over time, I will investigate, make a safe space for the people with narcissism personality to express themselves and be vulnerable and then but it could be years before we get there but then they will be able to to see oh it isn't just her it is me i do feel safe enough in this in this threesome right now to be able to express that i guess i i do have needs and i guess i i can be hurt and i guess i am lonely and i guess i am kind of needy on the inside i guess i can admit that they want to make it work and they go to couples therapy and they give it enough time. There's a chance that he might feel safe enough to actually start admitting those things to himself and then to some to two people who can take care of him. Um, I highly doubt it, but, you know, who knows? Jesse, I I'm just so you. tired of your mind games. It's not funny. Anymore. OK, then break up with me. I don't know. because it's always going to be something, and it's always gonna be on me. So my gut is telling me to walk away. So they're both in that space where they're both essentially daring the other person to break up, but both of them are unwilling to break up. You might have been in situations like that out there. You've probably seen your friends or family members go through situations like that before, where they seem to dare each other to break up and neither person does, but they talk as if they kind of have broken up, but they never actually do. Now, sometimes this is framed codependency, which is the an erroneous way to use that term. Codependency comes from substance abuse. Uh, just very briefly, you have someone who's dependent on alcohol, and then you have the codependent. So you have a husband who is dependent on alcohol. They need to drink in order to function, and they will have massive withdrawals if they, if they don't drink every day. Then you have the codependent. Uh, this is an idea that came out of substance abuse treatment and uh, conceptualization that if you treat the dependent person and you don't treat the codependent person, the codependent person will somehow influence the dependent person who's in recovery to drink again. And so you have to treat both people. So think of it as like a pilot and a co-pilot, dependent and a codependent. In our culture today, and I see a lot of therapists using this word wrong as well, they will use codependent as a synonym for dependent. So the, the idea of dependency, obviously there's a lot of different definitions, but in psychology and personality, the, the term dependency means that you depend, you over depend on someone and it's self-destructive or destructive in some way. And we tend to use Codep the word codependency to refer to that, where it's like, I, f I feel like when people use the word codependency, they're meaning it's like someone clings on to a relationship much longer than they should because they can't be alone. So this is dependency. So the so people out there, if you wanna if you wanna be smart to people like me, <laughs> don't use the word codependency wrong. Uh, in this situation, use the word dependency. I don't understand why we can't just use the word dependency because that's a pretty good word for it. Anyway, so we all are dependent on other people. There's no such thing as being completely independent at all. I'm dependent on my wife for love and attention and and validation in a way that I'll you know it's just human. It's just normal to be that way. We evolved as a social species like that. Anyway, so these two people. De over depend on each other to such an extent that even when their relationship is so horrible for both people, they can't let go of their relationship. 
So that's what we're seeing in the situation. Now, why would one person over, why would they over depend on each other? Well, the hypothesis could be that being alone is so horrible for them and so demoralizing that they'd rather be in the worst relationship on the planet than being alone. Being alone for some people who have been mistreated growing up is devastating. And this, it's from the outside, you're like, well, obviously being alone would be better. For people who have been mistreated and have a lot of chaos in their early childhood, it, this is actually more preferred, you know, it's, it's, it's more preferred than being alone. The other reasons why people might uh, engage in a relationship like this when all things are pointing in the direction of they shouldn't be together is due to projective identification, which I might go into uh, in another video, but uh, for time's sake, I'll just race forward and say that we have these needs to recreate relationships in our past in order to defend ourselves from the internalizations. And when other people allow us to recreate these past relationships, sometimes we kind of depend on that mechanism to distract us from the fact that we have the relationship in our heads. I'll go into that maybe more in another video. And I've obviously talked about it a lot in all the previous episodes of the podcast as well. But anyway, let's see what happens here. Just another train wreck happened. It's sad, you know, I have a good heart. I'm a very loving man and uh, I tried my best. But um, it is uh, not possible for me to be in something that um, is deceptive and is not real. I really love her with all my heart, and that's why this hurts so much. I'm not a deceptive person. I'm not a liar. I'm not manipulative. Okay? I'm not going to argue with you. That's all so I got to say. He wants to, yeah, but. So interesting scene. He's crying. We could speculate as to the veracity of those tears, but if we take it at face value, he is getting to that point where there's a little bit of vulnerability there and he's allowing himself to feel a feeling that is not anger. He's allowing himself to feel the sadness and the grief of probably a lot of past uh, problems that he's had in his early childhood. That's just a guess. And he's probably allowing himself to feel a little sorry for himself, which is normal as to being alone and it seems like he has a narrative that he's being rejected, which a lot of people on the outside wouldn't wouldn't narrativize the situation that way. But again, due to the distortions, one could have that narrative. And so this is an interesting development that he's this if I saw this in session, I would say, okay, this is this is a step forward. We have a long way to go, but this is a definite step forward because he's allowing himself to feel something other than anger. He quickly followed it up with, she's deceptive, it's all her fault, it's sad because of how screwed up she is. He's relying on that defense mechanism again, but this seems to be progress in an interesting way. It's like I've cried so many tears. It's like, it's nice, I mean, not nice to see him cry, but it's like, wow, he finally felt emotional. That shows me at least he cared a little bit. And this just ruined the moment, sorry. So interesting response. If we imagine that he might have narcissistic personality because she insulted him by saying, well, at least he shows he cared. Now it makes sense, her response on a certain level. I don't know if that's just me. I don't know about you, but I don't know. Her response uh, seemed to make sense to me. It was, it was a jab, a tiny little jab at him saying that he wasn't doing it in the past. It's a tiny little criticism. Now, for most people, they're able to withstand that tiny little bit of criticism, but because of that vast sea of worthlessness, it pokes through that perfection veil, and then you have to respond. You gotta like strike back at it. You gotta get angry at it. You gotta, you gotta stop people from saying things like that, and you gotta step up and move away. My guess is, is you went into a fight or flight response and, and he walked off. Again, total speculation. I, I would have to talk with him to know any of these things, but uh, that's just furthering my conceptualization of what's going on. What a sad girl. Ugh. The other thing that could be happening is that his emotions snuck through and he very quickly needed to clamp down on that 
and rely on an old pattern, which is to verbally abuse people and run away and establish superiority and dominance and a return to homeostasis for him. I am I not. You me? called pep oh. one. You know. What? Yes. One? Excuse you me? You know that your brain gets triggered really? by one glass of alcohol. Oh, how many Listen, be, like, don't live your life. When I know Drink when you want to. Oh, Listen what? Listen to whatever don't you want. Don't control okay? my I do not. Life. I do not control you. Yeah, you do. I do not yeah, control you. you. So that's why I'm leaving. Do what you gotta do. You Are you not getting that? I am not scaring you. I'm leaving. I you scared the I'm the so most people watching, including the two daughters, would look at this situation and be like, just go. It sounds like you guys want to break up. Just, you know, go back to Europe. Uh, Darcy, date someone else. Like, obviously, you guys are not good for each other. Why are you still arguing when it's so clear that you hate each other and you don't want to be with each other? It's that dependency issue, not codependency, that dependency issue of... I have to be with someone because I'd rather have a, the worst relationship on the planet than to be totally alone. We all need closeness in our life. And when we believe that we can't get functional closeness, then we will take dysfunctional closeness. So they're still fused, they're still you know, involved. And I wouldn't be surprised if the next episode they're back together again because they've been through this cycle so many different times. I don't have an alcohol problem. I don't sit at home, <laughs> guzzle booze. I don't know what the hell he's talking about. Worry about yourself. Keep drinking, honey. Worry about yourself. I don't really know his intentions, and if his love is really real, I question it now. But I don't know how to stop loving him either. So another interesting statement. I don't know how to stop loving him. So if I were able to explore her feelings of love, I would try to differentiate between love, the sort of love she deserves to have, this mutual, reciprocated, safe love, a secure attachment that she deserves to have, and what could feel like love, which is that over-dependency of, well, at least it's someone. At least I feel some shred of affection and love from that person. And any little morsel of that I will gobble up and will hold on to as, as long as I can. I wonder if when she says that she feels that love, I wonder if she's talking about that second one. Of course, it's just a, a way of narrativizing uh, an experience of love. But anyway, that, that would be something I would explore with her because – I think most of us can agree when we watch this, it's just like, why are you two together? Ugh. Again, as a therapist, I could never say if people should not be together or they should be together, but I would like to explore that with her if, if she were seeing me. I just couldn't sit there and allow her to, you know, manipulate and tell lies. I just feel numb right now. I don't know. Probably cry myself to sleep, but I guess we're done. I don't know. So when he says things like that, it's so surprising and so out of the blue that you got to wonder, were things happening that they didn't include in the show? Because his statements just seem so strange. What do you mean manipulative? What are you talking about? What moment? Now we do know that they do edit this up. So it makes me wish that I had the full, all the footage so that I could know if he was referring to anything resembling manipulation or not. I don't know. Get it back to the kids. Um, keep moving on. Got my daughters to love and worry about. I really loved her, I will always, but it didn't have to end like this. It probably did have to end like that. I didn't see any other way this could have ended. And I'm not quite sure if it has ended. I can't have imagined a different ending because they did this so cyclically and so regularly that I can't imagine. I just can't imagine the two of them saying, hey, you know what? No harm, no foul. We had a great time together. I don't think this is working out. God bless you. I wish the best for you with all my heart. 
kiss, hug. I just, can you see them doing that? <laughs> I just, just can't, can't see that happening. I wish that that did happen, but I can't see it happening. Next time. All right, well, that does it for the end of number eight, in which I react to the 90 Day Fiance show with Darcy and Jesse. What a ride. I wonder if this is the end, but I wouldn't be surprised if they get, get back together. So we will see. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself. Take a deep breath and shed the toxicity for, uh, as best you can. And take care of other people because we all deserve it. We really, really do.